I turned on the TV, and when I saw it, I immediately felt like, oh boy, this is, this is scary. And then when the second plane hit, I, I thought it was a replay or instant replay of what had happened already, and it took me a few minutes to realize that another plane had gone into the other building. And I just had this terrible sinking feeling that Dave was there or trying to get there. And as soon as the first hours fell and I've tried to describe the feeling, it's hard to describe. And the only way I could describe it is felt like my heart had been unplugged from Dave. From the 9-11 Memorial Museum, this is Our City, Our Story, a series where New Yorkers talk about their city and how September 11th changed that. I'm Will Thwaites, and this is my co-host, Jenny Pachuki, who sat down for an interview with Marion Fontana. I've been really looking forward to sitting down and talking to you. Me too. Um, So if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself. Uh, My name is Marion Fontana. I'm the widow of David Fontana from Squad One and the founder of the 9-11 Families Association. Marion's husband, David, was one of 343 firefighters and paramedics that died on September 11th. He was a shy, humble guy who was incredibly dedicated to the New York City Fire Department. In some ways, this story is his, a story of a firefighter who passed away on his day off. But Because he married such a strong and compassionate person, it's also the story of how Marion became an accidental activist for many of those who were impacted by 9-11. And maybe Marion got that way, strong and compassionate, because of where she grew up. You're a Staten Island gal, aren't you? Born and raised on Staten Island. What was it like to grow up in Staten Island? I, I love it because it was so different from the rest of the city. It's the borough of parks, the way Brooklyn's the borough of churches, so there was a lot of nature. Even though Marion lived across the water from Manhattan, she managed to make it into the city a lot as a kid. It helped that both of her parents were artists, and they wanted to share these little bits of culture with her. My mom is very elegant, and so she would take me to the opening of a Picasso show at the Whitney or the Met, Guggenheim, lots of art. And my father would do wild things, like take me on a bike to Chinatown to like some dim sum place that you had to go downstairs. <laughs> it was kind of gross, <laughs> and we were the only white people in there. It was probably during these excursions that Marion fell in love with both Manhattan and art. So when it came time to pick a high school, she decided to go to a place in Midtown called the High School of Performing Arts, or as a lot of people call it, just Performing Arts. It's a high school that a bunch of famous actors and singers went to. It even had a movie made about it called Fame. It was a fun time to go because Fame had just come out, and so it was an exciting time to be in the city. I'm still in touch with all my friends there, and I, I love that high school. It was really fun. So that was Marion's first tryst with New York City. She'd gone to have another one a few years later, this time sharing it with her husband, David. But first, college. Where did you go to college? I went to college at CW Post, where I met Dave. I really wanted to go to Sarah Lawrence. That was my first choice. Vassar was my second. She planned to study performing arts at one of these schools, which meant she needed to try out for their programs. And I was in my senior year of high school and about to go audition, and I had a subway accident. I got dragged by the double R train. It was called the double R, now called the R, and um, ended up breaking my jaw, missing all my auditions. But like so many things that happen, um, it was kind of meant to be, because then the only school I had auditioned for before I had the accident was a little dinky commuter college called CW Post. It was a state school in Long Island, and that's where I ended up meeting my husband. So, um, yeah, I guess it was meant to be. (laughs) It's funny, he was one of the shyest people I ever met. To be honest, I didn't notice him. 
And I was very, it was very hard to go from performing arts where everyone's kind of artsy and funky to this very businessy commuter school that I wasn't planning to go to. So in the beginning, I had a hard transition. But then one day I was walking around campus and this guy came up to me that I had become friendly with. He was with this gorgeous guy who had like a beret and little John Lennon glasses and a trench coat and army boots. And he just looked so different. He looked like he could have went to performing arts. And he invited me to a party. I went to the party looking for him and I never found him. Flash forward probably a couple months later and my room became the party room where everyone hung out. You know, we were listening to Joan Armitrady and playing backgammon and drinking gin and tonics. And I remember my friend saying one day, oh, that guy really likes you, I think. And I said, what guy? So the guy in the corner of the room that was sitting there staring at you all night. And I said, I don't know who you're talking about. I really didn't even notice him, literally. And then you know, the next night I saw him there, but I didn't pay attention to him because I had just broken up with my boyfriend of two years. And uh, I looked up and the whole ceiling was decorated with beautiful paper sculptures that were hanging from my ceiling. I didn't even notice that he had spent the whole night cutting these gorgeous decorations all over my room. And so I started talking to him a little bit and he asked to go for a walk. And I said, sure. And so he so I just have to get my stuff from upstairs and he comes down, he's wearing a beret, a trench coat, and army boots, and I'm like, oh my God, that's the guy. He was very shy, but he was extremely sweet and had this quirky sense of humor, and um, he was just surprisingly smart, and not surprised, I didn't think he was dumb, but he just was so shy that in the beginning it was very hard to to talk to him, but then once he loosened up, he he was just, you know, we fell in love pretty quickly after that. Did you think that you would be with him for the long term? No, he did, but I, I had fell in love at 16 with my first love, and I was 18 when I met Dave, so I was determined not to do that again. So in fact, I was like, no, 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 I tried to break up with him, I... I said, I'm not ready for another long-term relationship, just starting college. And he said, oh, you know, I know you're the one and I'm going to marry you. And I was like, I thought he was crazy. But he was persistent and charming and... Persuaded you, wore you down. Yeah, pretty much. It it didn't take that long. (laughs) It didn't take that long, but yes. Marion and David dated for 10 years after their time at CW Post together. And then one day, during a nor'easter storm, David proposed to Marion. We got married on September 11th, uh, 1993. Then a few years later, they had a son, a boy named Aiden. And yeah, the rest is history. Back when David and Marion were in college, they had both focused on art. And by the time they were building a life together, they were each still really committed to their craft. For David, it was sculpture. He was a really talented sculptor. And for Marion, it was theater and comedy. But they both still needed to make a living. So Marion, she taught and worked in the food industry. David, he applied to be a firefighter and worked odd jobs while he waited to hear if it was going to work out. Then one day, he got the call. He had been accepted to the New York City Fire Department. When he joined the fire department, what did you expect that it would mean for you? I really thought it was just going to be a job to pay the bills so he could sculpt, because he was very passionate about his art, and he was really good at it. But what ended up happening is he fell in love with the job immediately. Of course, I obviously worried and was scared about the job, but... I was actually envious because I was waitressing and catering and teaching and trying to um, do what I love, and he got paid to do what he loves. I couldn't believe how much he was obsessed with this job. He tied ropes while we were watching TV. He had a radio in his room. We listened to fires. If he were in the backyard and he smelled a fire and he heard trucks, he had to go and see what was happening. So it was really a part of who he was. Did you have time together? That was tough. We we actually, things started to get really stressful. I guess when Aiden was about four, 
Dave was studying for the lieutenant's test, which was extremely hard, and I was rehearsing a show, and I think it was the, probably the most stressful part of our marriage. He was coming home completely exhausted. He was falling asleep everywhere. He was trying to work double shifts to pay for Aiden. And the job, he started to bring the job home with him because he got busier and busier. And when he got busier and busier, he started to see a lot more stuff, you know, a lot of fires, a lot of, you know, deaths at fires. And it was very upsetting. He was at the Father's Day fire, which was one of the most memorable ones that I remember, where he just, you know, came home and, and just sobbed. They were lifting bricks off a wall trying to find the guys, and he did end up seeing one of the bodies of the firefighter friend that he knew. So, you know, it was a very stressful job. The stress started to kind of seep into our marriage, and so we started going to um, couples counseling, which was extremely helpful. I kind of fell in love with him all over again because he went in there and he did the work, and he started to really... Uh, acknowledge how stressful the job was and we started doing yoga together and we had date night and you know we really started to kind of find our way together in this new life as a family. Is it okay if I ask you about September 11th? Sure, yeah. How did your morning start that day? Well we were I was really excited because um, it was our anniversary. It was our eighth wedding anniversary, and I had a surprise for him. I had met a mom in one of my classes whose husband worked uh, in the sculpture department of Guggenheim. So I was going to get a private tour for him, and he was going to meet me, and he was starting a a month-long vacation. So we were really, really excited. So I called him that morning. It was Aiden's uh, second day of kindergarten. I had called him right before I was bringing Aiden to school, and he said, yeah, I'm done, I'm dressed, which means he's changed out of his bunker gear. And he said, I've been relieved, which means that a guy came in for him, and that means he can officially go, and I'll see you in 10 minutes. And I said, great. And so I went and got a coffee and sat down outside. I bumped into one of the women I work with at the studio, the dance studio where I was teaching. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm waiting for Dave. And she said, oh, you know, there was a, a plane crashed into a building. And I said, oh, no. And I, I got annoyed because I knew Dave. <laughs> now he couldn't miss anything. And I knew if he had heard that, he would have a really hard time not jumping on the truck to go. So I, I, I got annoyed. After 20 minutes and he was late, then I was like, oh, man, I hope he's waiting at home, like, wearing some sexy underwear because (laughs) I'm annoyed. And my friend Lori, I guess she must have intuited something because she said, I'm going to come with you. And I said, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm, I'm sure Dave's just in bed, you know, trying to be sexy or something. And she said, no, no, I'm going to go with you. So I went back, I turned on the TV, and when I saw it, I immediately felt like, oh boy, this is, this is scary. And then when the second plane hit, I, I thought it was a replay or instant replay of what had happened already. And it took me a few minutes to realize that another plane had gone into the other building. And I just had this terrible sinking feeling that Dave was there or trying to get there. And as soon as the first hours fell and I've tried to describe the feeling it's hard to describe and the only way I could describe it as felt like my heart had been unplugged from Dave. How did you start to navigate through that early time? It was really hard. <laughs> it was a long day. Um I am embarrassed to say this, but the first thing I did was send my friend Lori out to get a pack of cigarettes I hadn't smoked in 13 years. And um, I just knew it was going to be a long day. So people started to call and show up at the house. It was very overwhelming. But I guess in a way it was good to be distracted. I had friends coming over to clean my house. It was embarrassing because it was a mess. I was kind of in the mode of calling the firehouse and just wishing that he was at the firehouse just, I don't know, doing something. 
they finally picked up and this guy Jimmy answered Jimmy Lopez and they used to call him J-Lo and I said J-Lo J-Lo I'm so glad it's my anniversary and I'm sure Dave's there right and he's like no Marion he's not there he's not here he's I think he went and and then you know all my fears and my innate feeling that he was gone just came you know kind of confirmed for me it was just all chaos and it just all blurred together but basically I I was falling apart and I didn't want Aiden to see me like that so I had my friend pick him up and um, take him to her house and I had him spend the night I don't think he had ever had a sleepover before because he was only five but he was very excited about it when I talked to him on the phone the next morning I knew I had to come get him my parents were there at that point, and my dad and I went over to pick him up, and um, we kind of rehearsed what we were going to say when we got there. And, you know, my dad's wonderful, and he helped me get through probably the second most challenging moment of my life, which was telling Aiden that his dad was probably gone. When did you start to think of yourself as a widow? Well, it's ironic that I'm known as a widow because I totally never identified that way. But I guess, I guess all the wives at the firehouse started to wear their husband's wedding rings on chains around their neck. And I remember the first time I saw them all at the firehouse, they were bringing us in to do some paperwork or something. And there was, you know, 10 of us or nine of us, I don't even remember, wearing our rings on our necks and then I think that's when it hit me I'm like oh my god I'm like those war wives that are waiting to hear news from Vietnam or World War II or you know just waiting we're just waiting so yeah I felt like a war widow more than a widow it reminded me a little bit although it was completely opposite feeling of you know the mother's group when you're going through something, this need to commiserate is so powerful. So I remember feeling that when Aiden was born, and I was so grateful for my community of moms. So when I was up all night and felt like a terrible mother, I could call them and say, "And oh, I had a rough night too. Don't worry about it." I kind of feel like that's what happened with the widows. We would call each other in the middle of the night. We would kind of check in with each other and see if we were all having the same trajectory of grief. It just was a comfort to know they were out there kind of going through the same thing, not sleeping, not eating, staring at the ceiling, going to funerals together, buying black dresses. We became kind of the Jackie Onassis's standing on the church steps together. And, um, you know, it definitely bonded us. How did you find yourself in the situation where you did become politically active? How did that evolve? (laughs) That was completely by accident. Um, I guess about two weeks after 9-11, you know, the firehouse, because it was in my neighborhood, had become basically my way to escape my house because it was so filled with people all the time that I really needed a break. Um, It was completely overwhelming. So I would go to the firehouse and of course there were tons of people there and flowers all over, but I could go to the back kitchen and nobody was there and just the guys. So it became the place where, you know, we talked about everything and mostly I wanted news about the site. And then one night I went and they said, uh, you know, Marion, they're they're talking about closing this firehouse. And I said, what? And they said, yeah, they're, you know, SOC, which is the Special Operations, lost 87 members. And they don't have enough guys to fill this house. They need to put guys with our experience at other firehouses closer to the city in case something happens again. And I said, oh, my God, absolutely not, no. And they said, yeah, we're really upset, and we're, you know, we don't know what we're going to do. We can't protest. We can't strike. Uh, There's not much we can do. And I said, well, I'm going to do something. So I went home immediately. I called some friends in the neighborhood, and I would say within two days, we had a protest organized for that Friday. I got there, and I was so blown away by the amount of my neighbors, my students with signs, and it was just so 
moving. I would say there was at least 3,000 people just flooding the streets, Union Street, 7th Avenue. I couldn't even see how far it went, and it was so overwhelming and beautiful. Every news crew in the city was there. They had a couple of politicians speak. The firemen were not allowed to speak. And so I stepped up on the podium and I just spoke from the heart. And that was it. That opened Pandora's box to becoming the touchstone to all the firefighters and the widows. You know, Italian TV, Polish TV, Russian TV, every news outlet from all over the world started to call my home. And it was completely overwhelming. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I had to do some real quick soul searching and say, what is, what's going on? And what am I doing? And what do I want? And I guess what I felt was that I had this rare opportunity to kind of bring attention to firefighters and I'd always felt frustrated by how little they made and how hard they worked and didn't get paid for it. So I said, okay, this is what I'm going to use the media for. I'm not going to just talk about that day. I want to use it for good. Marion's early advocacy was just on behalf of firefighters. But as she started to appear in more and more media, Everyone from politicians to the families of victims started to reach out. My world was spinning so fast. I was going to funerals. I was going to meetings with the mayor. I was constantly going on news outlets. I was trying to collect data for the family about how many body parts were found and who was found on what day. I couldn't even think. I couldn't sleep. I was so overwhelmed and then slowly I started to get people to help me and volunteers and other widows and and then we became this organization sort of <laughs> <laughs> and then we got an office and then I got a volunteer to start taking the phone calls and getting the documentation and starting a website and it just all kind of spun from there and it was very overwhelming When did you finally have to have those quiet moments and process? It didn't happen for years. Um, I think I was really behind the curve. By the time all the funerals were over, the site was closed, I don't think I really realized how grief-stricken I was. I was just had it all kind of tamped down. And my mother and father, you know, said, you need to go to trauma therapy, sweetie. You're you're traumatized and you're, you have all the symptoms. You're not sleeping, you're drinking too much, you're smoking, you're a mess. And I said, you're right. And then I think that's when it hit me that I, I really needed help. When did things ever, have things ever felt normal again for you? Um, well, we, you know, I guess they call it the new normal. I don't know. I, I never stopped missing him. I never stopped thinking about him, but I feel like I'm determined to be happy and I forge ahead with absolute optimism. I'm a very optimistic person because I wear white shirts sometimes. That's my joke. <laughs> so, um, but it's a very volatile thing, grief. You know, it's a, it's a sneaky thing. It's like I could be fine. I could have a wonderful time. I have great friends. I have a great life in so many ways. And then I can just get sideswiped by something as simple as waking up and I look at the clock and it's 9-11. Or, you know, my son will have a certain expression that looks so much like my husband <laughs> that it'll kind of blow me away. And there's little, you know, and as... As the years pass, they're farther and farther apart, but um, they're always there. What was the 10-year anniversary like for you and the 15? We've had, you know, milestones as time marches on. Yeah, yeah. I guess the time, I think time has been the weirdest part of this. I feel like it just happened, and then I'm like, wow, I can't even believe it's been 15 years. It's just kind of stunning. I, I guess what's happened for me is I have stepped farther and farther away from 9-11. I didn't want it to be the thing that identified me for the rest of my life, and 
I started to feel less and less comfortable in front of the camera talking about it because it started to feel like it was more about me and less about Dave. I guess that was what really made me go, okay, it's time to step away and walk away. And so my anniversaries, to answer your question, have become quieter and quieter. The 10-year anniversary was at my home. I think that was probably, for me, the best one. A really good friend of ours, a firefighter, friend of Dave and mine, was retiring. And so we decided to make it a retirement party slash memorial kind of remembrance. It was in my home. I did a slideshow of Dave. And then the firefighters from France, I have this wonderful relationship with the Sepio Pompier of Paris. They come in every year and they're just adorable. And so they said, yeah, we're coming in with a few guys. Well, <laughs> it was like a clown car because a fire truck picked them up at the ferry and they just peeled out of the fire truck and there were about 30 of them. And I didn't have enough food and I sent my dad out. They had never had hot dogs, so I sent him out to get hot dogs. We t had champagne and toasted John Hageman, who was retiring, and it was, it was perfect. It was kind of the perfect day. This series is about New York and how September 11th changed New York and New Yorkers. Yeah. And from your perspective, you know, what is the role of September 11th in the New York story? Oh, wow. Well, I, I don't think I've ever been... I know a lot of the widows chose to move away. For, for them, it changed. New York changed for them. For me, it it made me even more feel even more strongly that New York is the best city in the world. I I saw the very best of people. I mean, we came together in this really profound, beautiful way, and I really was hoping that it was a feeling that could sustain the world for a while. And it was, it's, you know, looking at our current state of politics, it just breaks my heart how divided we all are again. And really, to me, where we are now is the exact opposite of where we were then in a lot of ways. I know we have it in us to get back there and that I think, you know, I went to the Women's March last week. I know we have it. We are a resilient city. We are a diverse city. We're a tolerant city. I mean, we live on top of each other and we have the lowest murder rate in the country. I mean, it's, it's remarkable to me. I see beautiful moments every day in the city of people helping each other in little ways and big. And I think there's no other place in the country like that. I think there's any other place in the world like that. And so I've, I would never want to be anywhere else. From the 9-11 Memorial Museum, this is Our City, Our Story. I'm Wilt Waits. I host and produce the series alongside Jenny Pachuki. This episode was also produced by Elizabeth Bistro and written by me, Wilt Waits. Our executive producers are Michael Frazier and Carl Cricko. Sound editing is done by Sam Behrens. If you want more from Marion Fontana, you can read her memoir, A Widow's Walk. And if you want more of this series, Our City, Our Story, we're available on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our website is 911memorial.org.